Hello and welcome to episode two of the Fit Foodie Roadshow, where I am interviewing industry professionals, um, giving you holistic tools for health and well-being during these quarantine times. And today I have with me one of my favorite humans on the whole planet and a longtime mentor of mine, um, Catherine Nyan. And let me just tell you a little bit about her. <clears throat> Catherine Nyan is a licensed professional counselor, a clinical supervisor in Portland, Oregon. She's worked in mental health and addictions for over 25 years. How are we that old? I don't understand. <laughs> she's a member. <laughs> she's a member of the American Counseling Association. She has a thriving private practice where she works with youth, adults, and couples. Um, she's a board member for the Oregon Recovery High School Initiative and is passionate about sharing the many faces of recovery with youth, inspiring them to see beyond their limitations. She's also involved with an organization called the Transformative Learning Collective, which is a group of women from a variety of racial and class backgrounds who are interested in exploration of anti-racism together. Catherine speaks and teaches courses about compassion fatigue, which is what we're going to talk about today and consults with agencies around Oregon and Washington. She enjoys working with people in a variety of settings from public and private schools to mental health agencies, to research organizations, to tradeswomen. And she's passionate about clinicians with years of experience and with, for new practitioners to the field. She's also a teacher at Portland State University. She teaches a variety of courses for the College of Education. She is an expert in her field and she's designed the curriculum for a number of the courses at PSU and continues to teach innovative counseling courses. They basically just let you do whatever you want at this point, right? Yeah, pretty much. She continues to be a site supervisor for school counselors all around the state of Oregon. And she says that practicing compassion satisfaction is a practice. We're gonna, ooh, that's exciting. We're gonna learn about that today. A part of exercising this uh, for her is through enjoying life by gardening, making art, riding scooters, and having adventures with her dog, Quincy, and her best wife, Lori. And Catherine has shared the gift of recovery for over 30 years and says that without it, her life would look a whole lot different. Thank you so much for joining me today. Wow. Um, what a bio, what a life, what a human. I'm so excited that you're here. And um, one of the things that you and I have talked about before is finding some way to collaborate and like bringing this idea of how to deal with compassion fatigue to um, a broader audience. And so I'm super excited that we're just like taking that first step today. And um, yeah, I have so many questions for you. Uh, First, can you just tell us a little bit about um, how this even became to be a passion of yours? Like what, we're going to talk about what compassion fatigue is and like how to avoid it and all of those things, but what even got you interested in this in the first place? Oh, thanks for asking that. That's so great. And thanks again for having me here to interview me. It's such a privilege and I'm so inspired by the work that you do. And I mean, you've been there for all of my training. <laughs> so for good or worse, better or for worse, here we are. Um, you know, I, I feel like I learned about compassion fatigue because I was fatigued. Um, I was working in an alternative high school doing mental health work. And um, I, you know, I've heard a lot of things in my lifetime. I've been through a lot of things. And I heard I was working with a kid who brought in something that that I wasn't expecting and I had a hard time uh, letting go of it. I had a hard time, I was dreaming about it, I was processing it and so um, I started doing some research and found out from actually a woman named uh, Laura Vandernoot Lipsky who's from our hometown, uh, Seattle, okay. and she works at Harborview and she wrote a book called Trauma Stewardship and that was the first time I'd ever felt, seen or heard about what the experience was that I was going through so I've basically gone to everything I can that she puts on, read every book that's out there. And then of course, as all things I usually do, then I have to teach about it because then that helps me even deepen that practice and learning. Uh, also, it holds that's me That's where I got that, yeah. Right, 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 right. That's also what then holds me accountable to part, right? So it feeds me because then, you know, I feel like, well, if I'm gonna talk about it, I gotta make sure I'm trying to practice it, so. 
-hmm. That's why I said it's a practice too, because it's not, you know, we often get taught that we should be doing self-care in some way that's uh, unattainable for most people that actually yes. have to work. Mm -hmm. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Um, I apologize if there's background noise. The kitten is eating a cardboard box again. Like I said, this is <laughs> what we're dealing with in these times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it could be worse. It could be my couch, I guess. Um, so, okay, so th this totally makes sense. So I remember when you were working at the high school and you were running groups and you were working with kids and and there's a thing that I've heard of, this is funny because you and I haven't talked very much about this, but I've heard of this thing called like secondary trauma or like where you're, you're the person who's, who people are going to with their trauma, but then you're like traumatized by it, right? In some way. And that is largely because a lot of, I think, people who go into these helping professions are so empathetic and we feel things so deeply. It's like, right, you just like have this, almost this secondary kind of, I don't know how to explain it, but I'm sure this is kind of what you're, what you're talking about is when, when we're in those helping professions and we're surrounded by people who are traumatized, it's really, it's important to keep those boundaries up, but it's also really hard, right? Like that's the, that's the struggle right there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, um, so the tra secondary trauma piece that you touched on is a really nice thing to, to touch on. And it's, it's, um, a lot of research was done on secondary trauma after 9-11 is when a lot of that research started coming out. Uh, our first responders, police, uh, fire and nurses, doctors that, you know, still have, uh, post-traumatic stress related to that. So, um, we can be traumatized both through the slow, uh, let's see, we can be affected by the slow impact. I kind of think of compassion fatigue kind of like uh, low level radiation that hits us every day. Mm -hmm. It's not about when am I gonna be fatigued, it's about like I am being fatigued right now. And especially <laughs> during this COVID era, we're all under so much stress and duress. If we're successful, or if we, um, I want to use a different word than that. I want to say if we ha we're resourced, um, then we're feeling, some people are feeling guilty because um, they have the resources and they aren't struggling. If people are working, they're really grateful that people are out banging pots and pans, but they're waking them up in the middle of the night doing that. <laughs> Well-intentioned people, right? There's people that are struggling to actually just make ends meet people that have been laid off, all, all the things, right? So we're all being really fatigued right now. Um, even I'm considered essential worker, so I'm a counselor. I'm working counseling and still teaching. Um, so everything had to go virtual basically over a weekend, um, which wasn't in my plan. I'm a counselor. I like to meet with people in person. And right. so this part has been weird. Um, but, you know, I have lots of nurse friends who've been under a lot of duress, uh, you know, because the hospitals aren't, you know, there's a lot of mixed information that's been going out there about how for how about how people can take care of themselves that are working uh, as first responders in hospitals. Mm -hmm. If they're not in the ER, you know, like um, people that are being asked to keep their um, their mouth coverings like in a paper bag in an office instead of being able to use multiple. I mean, it's just really it's tough out there. It feels like to me. And, this is, I know that I'm only touching a part of it, but so there's that kind of fatigue that happens. And then there's fatigue that happens when we are the direct, we have directly experienced trauma, a car accident, um, something like that. There's um, also secondary trauma can be witnessing trauma happening, but not actually, it's not happening to me, but mm -hmm. I'm watching something happen in 9-11 or something like that and I'm experiencing it. A lot of the time, it's because we're sitting and relating to, I mean, I don't know about you, but as an empath, right, we end up being, um, uh, we are visual people. So when people tell me stories, and I went through graduate school, two graduate schools to learn how to be a counselor, and they teach you, you're supposed to kind of be in it with the person while well, I'm visualizing. Yes. So, you're actually experiencing secondhand what's happened to a person if you're visualizing what's happening to them. So that's just, I'm jumping into this, but that's one thing that I like to really 
talk to people about working on is that if you're catching yourself rehearsing in your mind or seeing things on the news that are happening that are so terrible, um, rehearsing it in your mind or imagining it happening at the same time is actually um, your mirror neurons are causing you to get exhausted. So okay. mirror neurons are something that are in our bodies that are part of what made us uh, be able to survive this long in the world. It means it's a current example would be like, I bite into a lemon, your mouth starts to water because you know what that tastes like. Right. I'm carrying a bunch of boxes down the road and you're feeling like, oh God, you're going to drop them. This is mirror neurons. You're having that experience yeah. with me, even though, right? So why wouldn't that happen in counseling or nursing or nutrition work or all of these areas that, you know, um, I'm, I'm imagining, I'm experiencing it with you. And there's ways to create a little bit of distance in there. Not that we're, we're not saying I'm not going to be empathetic or caring, but for the highly sensitive person, we need to um, practice, um, which a uh, practice I teach called disidentification, which is hmm. looking at it like um, I'm not in the snow globe, but I'm looking at the snow globe, right? Oh, that's so, good. yeah. So you're imagining, you're hearing these, hearing these things, and this is not in a way to not. <laughs> I have to say, this is my caveat. This is not to say that that means everybody should dis disidentify with what's happening in the world and then never take any action or do anything. Right. This is often, right? This idea, some white supremacist values are like, oh, well, that's your problem. I'm mm -hmm. not talking about that. I'm talking about how so that we can have the energy to go work at food banks or we have the energy to go volunteer or do the things we need to do to make actually a difference. Yeah. This is a way to actually preserve energy so we can use it where we want to use it. So I want to make sure to be clear about that. So good. Yeah. Right. So that disidentification, that looking, so you're watching something on the news, you're not imagining in your mind, you're there with the people you're imagining. You're, you're kind of going, Oh, I'm in it. Okay. I'm going to try to dis I'm going to disidentify with it and watch it happening here instead. Mm -hmm. For some reason that tends to make a big difference. It's the same way with people when they're working through their own trauma. Sometimes when we're, re-experiencing, it's not healthy. If you've been traumatized and something bad has happened to you, it's it's not great for you to unaided go back and revisit that, right? Right. We want to visit those times with an experienced person or we want to experience them when our bodies are healed and healthy and go back in and visit ourselves and help ourselves, you know, help that younger yes. self. Yeah. Yes. Totally. That's so interesting about, oh my God, there's so much, so much gold in what you just said. That oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. No, it's good. It's good. Uh, um, the mirror neurons, I was thinking about how when, I mean, I've been doing a lot of like visualization, energy work, just in general about, you know, some goals that I have and things like that, but also like when athletes are training and they can't physically train all the time, they'll watch videos, right? And it's like a pretty well accepted fact that then, you know, we know that they're stimulating some of the same neurons right. in those muscles and all of that, right? So of course yeah. I'm reading and, and I don't even, I'm not even watching the news at this point. I can't deal with the video input of it, but if I'm reading, an article that my friend in Madrid posted about what's happening there and like imagining, because I also have a very vivid imagination, I'm imagining, you know, and I'm not going to say because I don't want to traumatize people by watching this video, but like imagining those details, right? And the, the smells and the sounds and the all of that, of course, that's going to impact my body in a similar way. Not obviously the same as if I'm right there, but it is traumatizing. It is exhausting. It's draining. Right. Right. It drains right. my energy to do that. So that's a really good. So you're saying that kind of imagining that capsule around it, that little snow globe. Yeah. Helps to just create that visual layer in my, in my brain to kind of not disassociate. Right. I care right. deeply but I'm disidentifying, is that the word? Disidentify, so I go, oh, 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 I was experiencing this with the person, like I'm there. I can't actually be helpful to them if I'm actually listening through that lens. I'm gonna be more helpful if I'm out here and I'm going, oh my God, that's horrible. I can't believe that happened to you. Yeah. And if, I, if you don't mind me saying the thing you just did where you were like, I'm not gonna tell you what I heard, this is actually, 
we could call that tip number two would be this idea of we don't slime each other. So without consent, Ooh, yes, I ask people to practice saying, can I tell you about this thing? That's why I never, I never say I've actually, I don't, I think I've told a therapist, but no one else about the thing that caused my compassion fatigue to kick in. Mm. It was horrible. And that's all we need to know. Everybody can imagine the minute anybody hears that they probably imagine something I would. Right. Um, and so, um, practicing not, I call it sliming each other. You know, we don't slime each other. So it's the Ghostbusters, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> right, but 80s children. Yeah, so you would get consent from your friends. Hey, so I saw some stuff on the news. Could we have a news rant and just talk about that? Or yes. hey, this really bad thing happened to me or I just talked to somebody about a really terrible thing. Can I debrief it and do it with you? If they say yes, great. You know, are you, you know, even asking, are you resourced enough to do that right now? Whoa, yeah. that's advanced skills right there. Yes, yeah. I love when people ask me that. <clears throat> In fact, it is shocking to me sometimes when people ask me that, especially people that I'm in a coaching relationship with or in a mentoring relationship with. I have this one woman that I mentor and you know, like it's my job as her mentor to like be there for her and to listen to her stuff. And she often will ask me before she shares something, even something quote unquote negative with me. And I just think it's so respectful and like, I don't know where she learned to do that. It wasn't from me. Now I'm learning that from her, you know, which is so lovely. Yeah. But, but it is a real thing, you know, and I've had, um, I've definitely had those moments when, you know, it's like people sharing gory animal violence or something on social media. And like, you don't have, I don't have that. You know, I don't know. I'm scrolling down. I think I'm going to see a cat video and it's like some abused dog I, or something and you know it's like yes. oh my god as a highly sensitive person that is traumatizing and so yeah I think that is a really important piece to um not assume that someone is resourced enough to take in all that information and and like you said you talk to a therapist about it like if I have someone in my life who is a therapist or who I have that agreement with you know, checking in with them, like, okay, that can creating that space to talk about those things that I feel like I need to process externally. Right. Yeah, that's huge. Okay. So disidentification, I like that we're creating a list of tips already. Disidentification <laughs> and then not sliming. Not sliming. Right. I love it. Um, hmm. And you said something in there that made my, made me think, Oh, yes, it was about the mentee and how they ask you. Oh, and I was thinking about how um, I work a lot with people who work with animal rights mm -hmm. stuff in my private practice. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, that's, I've attracted that to my life. Of course. Lucky enough. And also, I noticed that people that work in that field are really good about that. They're really good about saying, so are you resource enough for me to talk to you about this thing? Or people that work in animal shelters see some of the, um, hardest parts of humanity, I think. Um, you know, this is one area where we see that, you know, um, where um, neglect and abuse happen. And um, that can be a really difficult thing to talk about. And people, a lot of us are doing really heavy duty work with really potent subjects. And we need people to be able to speak to about that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I know when I was trying to specialize my, my clinical nutrition practice to work with people who had autoimmune disease, you know, I was going to have that be my specialty. I got burnt out really fast because a lot of those people are not resourced. You know, people who are really sick with chronic illness are not well resourced and often don't have practices or boundaries in place. And so I, and I didn't have those in place for myself. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was a, trial by fire for me of, um, you know, I think that was probably my own compassion fatigue, you know, moment of like, okay, I need to back off. I didn't take any one-on-one -on -one clients for a while because I just couldn't figure out how to um, not get so enmeshed in their stuff, right? And not have their, their pain and their results and their, you know, adherence to their protocol or whatever be about me, right? As a practitioner. So... Um, for people who are working with 
you know, either people who are on the front lines with the COVID-19 patients or for people who are working with, you know, maybe they're, they have a functional health practice and they're working mostly with chronically ill, you know, or people who work with mentally ill people, like how do you help them help practitioners navigate, um, that compassion fatigue and, and having those boundaries? Yeah, and um, I'm gonna, I'm just kind of writing notes as we're talking because I wanted to just note there, you said two things in there that are really helpful for people. Number one, you said that you, I wrote down say no. So you decided not to work with a certain population because it was activating you. Um, for me, um, there are certain populations, even as a therapist, I don't always work well with. Mm. Um, and so, uh, and what I'm talking about with that, I'm talking about like, I grew up with a parent with uh, high functioning ASD. And so sometimes I find that pushes my buttons. Mm -hmm. um, I also lived with a heroin addict for a period of time in my life. And mm -hmm. um, I find that that pushes my buttons also. Mm -hmm. And even right now, isn't it so interesting, like saying that out loud, I feel afraid people will judge me or think that that means something about me, but it doesn't, it doesn't mean that I can't do that work because I can, I've just learned over a period of time and practice that I don't, just because I can get through something or work through something doesn't mean I have to. And that's been a really important distinction for me as a healer, as a therapist, as a clinical worker, as a human, that mm -hmm. I, I can go through a lot of things and I don't actually have to anymore. And I'm so grateful for that knowledge. Um, the other thing that you said was this thing about social media. You were like, yeah, I can't watch, I cannot get on Instagram because inevitably there's some animal abuse thing and I can't handle it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I just recommend like I have a 15 minute timer on my, on my social media. Um, so when I'm on there, I'm 15 minutes and then I'm off. Um, having times where our phones are off or put away from us, really unplugging is uh, really super helpful. And I could hear those for things you were already saying. So mm -hmm. I think they get kind of harped on a lot. So I don't want to focus on that too much. In terms of the ways to help practitioners, um, first is, uh, feels really important, is kind of like just kind of knowing symptoms. Like I know I'm fatigued when. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, and before I, and boy, you know, this thing is, it's always so tricky to talk about. When you introduced me, I talked about how I found compassion satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's such an important part to start out for people is like, we get satisfaction from being compassionate and kind. We get internal happiness. For some of us, it's a moral obligation. For some of us, it's a spiritual or, you know, all kinds of different reasons why people feel satisfied being helpers. Um, and um, so, like, we're working towards creating energy for compassion satisfaction. That's part of why we're looking at this, these other things, so that we can get back to that, if that makes sense. Totally. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, let me just see here. So some of the symptoms I really like, uh, Laura Vander Newt Lipsky in her book, Trauma Stewardship, she has just this really great um, uh, list of symptoms. Uh, and she talks about uh, trauma, she talks about people as trauma stewards and that they're steward, stewarding people through trauma, which I really like this idea because it addresses people um, she addresses everyone, law enforcement, teachers, researchers, um, you know, animal rights activists, nurses, you know, that we're all working in the face of trauma and that we're often trying to help fatigue people. We're often trying to help um, steward people through that. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a lot of people that work on the front lines are that are exposed to trauma and dysregulation. Um, and that impacts our work with each other and our clients, and most importantly, uh, our lives outside of our work too, because that's, I mean, we literally work jobs to make money to be able to have a life outside of work, right? Right. So um, some of the symptoms are things like um, experiencing kind of free floating, free floating guilt, um, feeling fatigued all the time, 
feeling helpless or hopeless, having a sense that you can never do enough or even hypervigilance, uh, where you find yourself doing, you're getting caught in too many details, maybe doing too much for the thing. Mm -hmm. um, Laura Van der uh lists things like diminished creativity, uh, the inability to embrace complexi complexity. So this idea that problems we try to, we go into black and white thinking, you can see that's happening right now in the United States um, okay. around um, the COVID-19 and um, us being closed down, you know, uh, being asked to stay at home. Mm -hmm. um, so minimizing problems also can be a symptom. Uh, having physical ailments, um, like you were talking about, um, dealing with uh, the endocrine system, right, can really be impacted by trauma and by fatigue, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I've worked with people who have had, oh man, they just get so inflamed. They have arm braces, leg braces, um, you know, Gosh, you just see like the, the people, so many people ending up with alcoholism and mm -hmm. substance use disorders because they're trying to manage these symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, or it goes internal, which that's kind of your specialty, right? Like what happens to the body when they're experiencing these things? Right. Right. And so much chronic illness does have that trauma component. And mm -hmm. so I've spent the last, I think I've spent, I've referred more people to therapy in the last year or two since I started working with chronic illness and I've had I've turned people away and said you know what let's you know I can't I can't help you yet like let's go have you work with a therapist first and then come back and we'll do nutrition because you know they're just so they're so reactive to every single food because their nervous system cannot calm down so you know I do a lot of work with elimination diets and taking someone who is super reactive to everything anyway taking more foods out of the equation is not the answer at that point you know we need to increase the amount of things that they can eat and uh, and have their body calm down so sometimes they literally need something like um, dynamic neural retraining or um, you know wrap what is the eye movement desensitization like those types of therapies are so helpful because they address the trauma in a way that, you know, helps the, that literally helps the nervous system calm down. But, you know, I, did, I couldn't imagine when I first started going into nutrition that I would be referring people to therapy as much as I do. But when you're working with chronic illness, it is, it manifests in all of those different ways. And sometimes you can't, you have to kind of go with what you have to uh, triage, <laughs> you know, what's, what's most important. That makes good sense to me. I have got a number of friends who have, um, are just right now practicing not disassociating while they eat. Mm. Like just the practice of sitting and eating when you've had eating and body image issues um, without having other stimuli happening at the same time can be, right. just that can be a challenge for people. Huge. Yeah, Huge. So I can appreciate yeah. what you're saying. and. So, yeah, so, and I can really see where these two support each other. So, yeah, for me, um, part of the recovery from this, and I'll, I'll cover a couple more symptoms, but the recovery from this actually was like seeing a nutritionist. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a naturopath, actually, and then um, working with a yoga therapist to help uh, begin to recalibrate my nervous system in a way that I wasn't experiencing getting colds all the time or in a way that inflammation was decreasing. And that is all still still just quite a journey for me. Um, it's not like, and then I did that and everything was better. That's just, right. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. Yeah, but it is that practice um, that is what I value. So, um, you know, the other things that kind of come up for people are things like um, deliberate avoidance, um, having the inability to listen to people, like really truly slow down and listen long enough to hear what people are saying. Mm -hmm. disassociative moments right sense of persecution people sometimes in their workplace are fi we fixate I have definitely done that we fixate on people and like this person's you know kind of coming for me or oh. you know it's just this interesting way that we'll project and perseverate on someone and that thing may I mean in my case that was happening and also um, there was a lot of internal work that needed to happen mm -hmm. to help support my nervous system um, so 
uh, I talked about anger and cynicism, I think difficulty empathizing, feeling numb. You'll find a lot of counselors and nurses may experience kind of a numbness after working uh, a lot of intensive work with trauma. The thing I see the most uh, is sleeplessness and sleep difficulties. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, right? That seems like that is the biggest thing. And until you can get street sleep online for people, I'm with you. Like, what are you supposed to do with people if you can't actually, if you're not sleeping and regenerating, I was not sleeping. I don't think I had REM sleep for like four years. Good Lord. Yeah. I felt like a psychotic person. I just felt yeah. like I wasn't based in reality. I don't know. Yeah. I saw tracers all the time. I don't know. Yeah. No. <laughs> like what moms go through, I think, or something, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's real. It's real. And that is, like you said, the regeneration that happens with sleep. The, our ability in REM to, for our unconscious mind to work out problems, right? And then also just like all of the other benefits of actually resting. And it makes sense. I mean, just from like a neurochemical, right? Like I always come back to the physical, but from a neurochemical standpoint, you know, your, your serotonin is depleted, especially when you're replaying those traumatic events over and over and over again. So how can you possibly even have that melatonin cascade working properly when you have no serotonin to feed it? And then, you know, people try to self-medicate with carbs, right? I mean, that's the ultimate comfort food is like, let's eat all of the sugar and carbs and, you know, which is very wise. Like, that's the thing that I think people don't understand is there's a, there's a method to that madness when people are trying to uh, self-medicate with food. Often it's very, it's very simply biochemical. You're trying to make more serotonin, you know, like it's not a willpower issue. You're not wrong. It's not bad. It's like, there's a, there's a method to that. There's a reason for that. So anyway, I could go on about food shame for a whole other hour, but let's get back to the. Yeah. Yeah. But it is, it is part of the reason why a lot of, you'll see a lot of teachers, a lot of therapists, especially, you know, people assigned female at birth where they're experiencing like a roundness to their bodies because they've just been dumping cortisol for so long. Um, yeah. You know, and not really understanding how to help release some of that. So, you know, through the lymphatic system or whatever. So, yeah. So, you know, and I think you'd love this. There's another person called um, Jen. Oh, I can't remember his first name. Gentry. He talks about like there's phases of uh, pe people like you and I that go out there to do service for people. There's the zealot phase. I thought you'd love that because we've both been zealotists and we've known each other forever, yeah. right? Yeah. Just quit smoking and you'll know what a zealot is, right? <laughs> that was me. Yeah. Right. Then, so that's the phase where people are willing, we're jumping in, we want to be helpful, we know the right things, we're just so eager that sometimes we're saying, we're, we're alienating people sometimes by being a zealot, actually. Or every time, yeah. Right, you know, yeah. yeah. Then there's um, moving into the irritability phase. This is people start to notice <laughs> when we're fatigued, right? We're getting irritable. We're, and then the next phase is withdrawing. The next phase after that is the zombie phase. So, you know, I love that phase. Oh my God. And then the phase after that is either pathology begins or renewal and maturation begins. So you and I, because we've known each other for so many decades, we've gone through the renewal and regeneration cycle. So many times. Yeah. yeah. And even just professionally, I feel like I've been through that so many times. Maybe it's a little more subtle, you know, after the first round, but yeah, that makes so much sense. I love that model. Well, and if you know what it is, maybe you're like, uh-oh, I'm starting to be really irritable. I'm uh, really impatient with other people. Mm. This might be my fatigue speaking. And then you're like, okay, that's, I like that because then you're not, it's not a projection onto something else. But the other side that people go with it is they go into this side where they're like blaming themselves. And so it's really important to consider the systems in which we work in. I just think it's really important. I always, I always want to take a moment just to say like, we're working within a capitalist system that's designed to make everybody believe they can be a millionaire. Yep. We're all and, embarrassed millionaires in America. That's right. So, totally embarrassed. Well, I don't know, but Pete, well, I mean, a, there's a lot of research about programs where they're like, you know, 
getting people to sell Tupperware or knives or purses. And they always, you know, what is the thing that keeps people involved in doing those things? There's nothing wrong with that, obviously. It, and it's that they're teaching people that they're going to be a millionaire. And the statistics around who actually makes it are very, very low. That doesn't, I don't, that doesn't matter. I don't have any value system around that. But the thing is, is that we take blame when we're not. Yeah. When we're not highly successful, highly rich. We're not, you know. And then um, the systems do things like they blame us. Or like I saw a meme the other day that said, uh, it was like, yeah, um, let's call everybody heroes instead of just paying them what they deserved when they were doing the job before this. Right. Like this kind of thing is what I'm trying to get at, right? This idea that um, there are systemic issues and often people will try to own these things. So this is with inst institutionalized racism, you know, patriarchy, you know, all these things they can, um, they can cause us to try to blame ourselves for systemic problems. And I just think before we can go into like things we can do to help ourselves, some of that might mean making sure to acknowledge where some of the blame lies and that it's not within us. Cause we're taught also the only way to fix things is to be responsible. You and I, especially how we came up, we were, we were taught that you like figure out what your part is in everything. Right. Yep. yep. And so to know that there's some things that you and I don't have inf influence over Christian hegemony, you know, um, all of these pieces that we don't have any control over that, that dominate this, the larger system. So I, I probably, I might be alienating people from your podcast right now. <laughs> or from your YouTube. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I think I need to hear that because I think that, um, you know, we were, we were brought up in that idea in a very healthy way, right? Because you and I were very, you know, selfish, wild teenagers. And, you know, we needed a dose of that kind of humility of like, oh, maybe I had a part in this you know, thing that I thought was everyone else's fault my whole life. Maybe I'm not a victim of every single thing, right? But to be able to also, I think there's a very unhealthy way that people, especially people who are assigned female at birth or femme, uh, are kind of brought up in this martyrish kind of version of that, where they're going to take everything on in order to not make waves or to people please or to you know, there's like the dark side of that as well. Right. And the healthy version is to be able to see where those lines are. Where am I, where am I caught in this system that doesn't allow me to move vertically or diagonally or whatever, right? I'm only stuck in this, whether that's class or whether that's, you know, um, institutionalized racism or sexism or whatever, heteronormativity, you know, whatever, you could go on and on, the gender binary, but where am I in that system? And how has that, you know, benefited or how has that been a detriment to me, right? And I think that's, again, we could talk about that for a whole other episode probably, but, um, but the idea that not all of what I'm experiencing is of my own making. I mean, I heard someone say the other day, like, this is the first major problem in my life I didn't cause. <laughs> Right? Nobody knows how to handle a pandemic. Exactly. Nobody knows. Like maybe if you're a hundred, you could give us some wisdom about, you know, the flu of 90, a hundred and however old too, right? You could tell, no, but you were a baby. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's, Nobody. Really, it's really true. Yeah. And for some people that I'm working with in therapy, you know, they're having uh, eat, you know, binge and uh, purging behaviors, starving mm -hmm. behaviors show up, mm -hmm. old behaviors that they haven't seen it. And I'm saying to them, let's be compassionate and kind with ourselves that it took a pandemic for you to have a relapse right now. <laughs> pandemic. So let's just, let's just give credit where credit is due and then we'll just get back on the horse again, you know? Yes. Um, but yeah, this, so we, we can't, we haven't, we can't control it. We did not cause it and I'm not smart enough to cure it. So all of us are just getting in there. Um, yeah, and so I appreciate you validating and restating some of those concerns that are out there that are not in our control, especially as two white women on this. It just feels important to acknowledge those things um, because we tell everybody, you know, um, all you have to do is work hard and pull your bootstraps up and you can be successful. And there clearly are systemic things in place to keep people where they are. Yeah. So, um, 
So in terms of managing fatigue, I'd like to pick it out into three different sections. There's like what you can do for yourself at home with your body in your life. And then like, what can you do? And of course, all of us are doing that all in one place now. So this is kind of funny, not funny. Um, then right. there's the self-care at work. Like, what do I do for myself while I'm at in the workplace? Mm -hmm. And then there's, what can I do for myself systemically in mm -hmm. my, so that's that other piece that we were just talking about. That's like, um, mm, larger, larger picture. And then for people who are actually working with clients, that's the other section, which is like, how do you work with, um, that empathic mirroring that's happening and how do you help yourself with that? And I don't think that's necessarily, uh, that's not only obviously for therapists or nurses, or I just see a lot of them in my, um, private practice, uh, because mm -hmm. of the entity focus. So, um, and okay. So I like to kind of talk about the idea that, you know, we're not talking about the kind of self-care that's the, um, go take a lavender bath self-care. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, we're working with real people with real problems. So, and, and with real lives that are happening. So, um, there's some real basic things. I mean, so most of us, a lot of people can afford therapy right now. I've had my, my private practice has gone down by about a third because of people's layoffs or, um, you know, they're not, they can't, I take insurance, but some people just pay out of pocket to see me and they're not able to afford that right now or for consultations. So um, just keeping in mind that since we can't all afford therapy, like there's some real basic things like mindfulness-based stress reduction activities. That sounds like a lot of, there's just this kind of classist academic language around that. Yeah. What that literally means is practicing things like slowing down your breathing right now. I'm talking with you, so I'm a little nervous and I'm heightened and I'm excited. So my breathing gets faster. So if I can even practice slowing down my speaking, slowing down my breathing pace, right? Mm -hmm. um, so number one, just trying that. Like for some people, even considering watching how they breathe, can trigger a lot of anxiety and anxiety response. So I like to focus with like just the slow down thought because that slowing down is whatever it is for each person individually. And then um, I like to have people practice thinking about noticing gravity's impact on the body right now. Oh, that's nice. So it's not a focus on because breathing can be like, am I doing it right? I'm not really sure. If people are anxious, then they, they start to, you know. Um, <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, yeah, so right. True. So, and I'm one of those people, actually. So that's probably good just to name. Like, I'm a person that's like, also, you know, I want to get an A in this and I'm not breathing right. So noticing gravity really helps. Um, so you're noticing your seat in the chair. You're noticing your arms want to dangle down. Your feet, you know, fall down to the floor. As I get older, I notice that my cheeks start to sag more. I can feel all these parts of my body slowing and being held by gravity, which nobody can argue with. Gravity is a thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so then that naturally, I, then I can actually notice the breath cooling at the bottom. And then once I'm there, then I can begin to kind of play with the breath and notice what happens with it. So that's kind of a fun, a fun thing. And I found that to be successful so far, almost 100% of the time. Yeah. So easy. I love that. Yeah. So there's uh, right now, you know, I'll avoid talking about the washing hands sensation activity since we're all washing our hands so much. <laughs> That's a little COVID humor. Um, but, you know, asking for calming touches, mm -hmm. uh, doing things that mammals do, like shake, you know, whenever my dog has something that's hard, she shakes. For me, that for people that can look like, Sometimes between sessions, I'll turn on one of these to social club and do the Chan Chan, you know? Nice. I'll, I'll put on something that makes my body move. That's, I'm not going dancing, I'm just moving. Um, there's old, old school stuff like progressive relaxation you can do where you're, you're um, uh, flexing parts of the body and moving through from your head to your feet or your feet to your head, whichever mm -hmm. feels right. Um, and there's also like more controlled breathing. You know, I practice yoga therapy. So um, pranayama is a form of breath work and there's a lot of different exercises for that. And sometime we could do that together if you want. Um, but um, so those are some things that are really 
kind of the cornerstone, I think. But see, people say meditate, and then people are like, well, I don't know, I don't know how to meditate, or I don't want to, or I can't. I can't concentrate right now for my med meditation practice. In fact, I've been stopping my yoga classes at 45 minutes because my mind is on fire by 45 minutes, but I'm still practicing, right? Yes, uh, that's so good to hear because I feel like people think that meditation equals a particular, you know, they do all these studies about the brain waves of these Buddhist monks and blah, blah, blah. And they think that meditation has to look like an altered brain state Yes. When really you could just be committing to a sitting practice or a mindfulness practice. And I think even taking the meditation word out of the equation sometimes is really helpful because it becomes like a goal, yes. which is so antithetical to the idea of a mindfulness practice, right? Where you're just Love getting that. presence. Right. Yeah. And that's also really helpful for me to hear that you're even struggling with it because I noticed that like, if I'm not listening to a guided meditation right now, I'll either just fall asleep or I start obsessing about literally anything, nothing even traumatic necessarily, but like, why is this person's mustache this particular way? I mean, just stupid stuff, right? But my brain is wanting to fixate on things right now. So right, yeah, that's a good reminder. Right, little, little details that you just kind of get caught on. Yeah, yeah, so... Um... I'm glad we agree on that, just that we've known each other for so long and like this idea that some of the language, it's like once you name a thing, it kind of ruins it a little bit sometimes. <laughs> so if we're calling it meditation, then what, we're not going to use that word or self-care. I hate to, I try to not even use that language because uh, it just gets so bludgeoned by people. Yeah, and it does, people do associate it with a spa day or a bubble bath, which have their place and that's lovely and I will say that a home spa moment is one of the bingo squares on my self-care bingo challenge because great let's do that it's fun put an avocado on your face I don't care but like you know it's not the whole picture and so you know there's also a lot of other things that we can do that are self-care like turning off our phones after 5 p.m one day a week is on my list because Sometimes you just got to disconnect, right? So obvious often. And like you talked about the carbs, like I didn't realize because my body was in such a heightened state of activation all the time. I would have a cup of coffee in the morning before work. I couldn't sleep at night. When I stopped drinking the coffee, it helped my sleep. Even though it was one cup in the morning, it's because wow. you were, I was starting up here drinking coffee, bringing myself here or oh my eating gosh. sugar or carbs at the end of the night. Uh, right. And then turning my body into this like really terrible state before bed, which it's not like I don't always do that. So let's just say that like I definitely, totally. but I noticed when I was able to stop doing that for a period of time and then my body was able to calm, then I could have a cup of coffee. Like now I can drink coffee and it doesn't bother me. So that's the other thing that I think we think of. We think if we're going to do something, we have to do it forever. Right. Yeah. I have to eliminate coffee from my diet forever or eliminate sugar from my diet forever or or even the other opposite, like I have to, if I try um, medications to help balance my moods, that that means I'll be on them forever. Mm. I think it's a mistaken idea that, that these things can't be used for a period of time, like to heal the body. And then yes. you can, you know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. It's like yeah. the people who have, you know, really um, reactive food allergies when they're home and in their daily grind, but they go on vacation and they can eat whatever they want. It's like when we're in that heightened stress response, we don't have as many, you're talking about mental, emotional, psychological resources. We just don't have the same physical resources also, you know, a stressor is a stressor. So we can handle a certain number of stressors. And if sugar is a stressor and compassion fatigue is a stressor, maybe both at the same time is more than I can handle right now. Right. Or whatever the thing is. Yeah. That combo. Yeah. I think that's important for sure. And then if you get into polyvagal theory, there's all these ideas about the vagus nerve and about how we're trying to self-soothe. So the vagus nerve is a nerve, and I see you mm -hmm. nodding, but for people who don't know, it's a nerve that runs down the back of the body. I think there's, it's known in Eastern medicine and Western medicine. Um, the body is so strong that even if you're unconscious, it continues to breathe. 
Mm -hmm. which I always think the breath is that powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and the vagus nerve uh, touches on all the organs in the body and um, helps with regulating um, your uh, parasympathetic nervous system. And yeah. so when you're trying to calm ourselves, things like eating actually helps to touch that vagus nerve. That's right. But there's other things that we can do to do that, like um, humming, singing, mm -hmm. chanting, um, doing things like singing. It's why I think runners get, uh, it's part of the impact of running because you're doing that really rhythmic breathing, mm -hmm. you know, um, even like people that are power lifting, like, you know, we both have done in our lives at different times, right? Like that creates that impact, um, rolling on something, laying on your back. Um, often people forget the value of laying, laying on your back with your pelvis, you know, on a pillow with your legs up on a chair, like laying upside down. I have people do this in my therapy office all the time. If you're dealing with anxiety, your body cannot, you can't pass out if you're already on the floor with your feet up. It's just, it's just a dynamic somehow. Yeah. It's like it almost tricks the nervous system into calm, the calming response. Mm, so good. Yeah. So, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how long you want to talk, Michelle Casey, right now it is 3.07. Well, we could keep going for a little bit longer if you have some more tips about, um, yeah, I can, because uh, we talked about what you can do at home for your, for yourself and your own body. Mm -hmm. And then you were talking about, you know, work or, um, I think maybe we could, maybe we could give kind of like for the practitioners that are on the front lines, what is like a work related or, um, you know, compassion, satisfaction related kind mm -hmm. of activity or practice or whatever for them. And then also just for the people that are at home and like, not necessarily on the front lines, but are feeling traumatized by reading headlines. And maybe it's the same practice, I don't know, but what's kind of, what can we do as people who are just like regular people experiencing compassion fatigue, maybe for the first time right now? Mm. Yeah, that's such a great, that's such a great choice. Uh, great, great focus. Um, so moving into that, it would be, there's, we, we kind of touched on the healthy lifestyle choices, right? And I call it avoiding intoxicants and pulling weeds. So the other part, and maybe this is kind of the wrap up to the individual that moves into the working with other people is like pulling, like if we have relationships that are dysfunctional or difficult or we're caregiving more than we're receiving um, and we can let them go, like that is a really good place to start because often we practice on the people around us, some of our best skills and some of our worst skills, you know, <laughs> so like having um, really considering that and making sure that we're getting social, positive social support. The other thing is not reactivating ourselves. So like a lot of, it's amazing how many trauma survivors you know, the thing I never said was that I'm a trauma survivor and um, trauma survivors are impacted more with compassion fatigue than people who haven't dealt with trauma. So, so that makes sense. Yeah, right. Like yeah. you're wired for it. Totally, you're wired for it. Yeah. I mean, a study through Kaiser talks about this, right? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're wired for that. I'm sorry, I have to grab a little sip. <laughs> okay. Um, so, oh, but how many people I see in therapy who they might do therapy all day long or nursing all night long, and then they go home and watch a show like Special Victims Unit or like ER, or, you know. It blows my mind. What right. is, why do people do that? Do you know? Well, it's trauma mastery. So we're looking, I mean, so many of these things we're talking about are such bigger things, but it's the idea of like, for me, I, when I was in that fatigue state, I was watching special victims unit every night and it was like i was like elliot stabler is gonna he's gonna it's gonna end with like someone's busted justice prevails at the end see that's my theory that was my theory is like they want to see the good guys win they want to see the bad guy put away like that yeah. whole paradigm must somehow be therapeutic in some way i don't know Right, right, right. And there's a whole concept around trauma mastery that we could talk about another time, but okay. often it's where we, we get into the thing. I mean, look at me, I work, I work with adolescents. You know, I was a troubled adolescent. This is part of trauma mastery is that I 
work with a population where I had the most trouble trying to master that which was difficult for me through mm -hmm. becoming a therapist, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can't be a therapist this long without having owned those parts. <laughs> it's like me working with autoimmune disease or chronic illness, right? Yeah. Same kind of thing, right? Yeah. yeah, we often do that. But then that does, the part of that is that it is what makes us more vulnerable to fatigue. Mm. And so if we know that, then we just go, okay, so that just means, that doesn't make, that's not like I'm bad because I had trauma. That's more like, oh, I just need to put, I need to redouble my efforts. I need to put a little extra effort than the average bear into this. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's, that's been a good thing. Um, right. So for working, right, there's ideas about how to leave work at work, practicing little rituals for turning yourself on and off. You know, mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of writing about this when my wife was working construction because I would watch her and she would take all the dirty clothes off every day. And then she would take a shower and come out and she'd be refreshed next morning, mm -hmm. put on the clothes again. You know, there was like a, an outfit, you know, and as a counselor person, like I'm putting on the same clothes, I might be still cooking dinner at 7 p.m. in the same outfit I worked with, and there was no transition. There was just like no pushing ritual. through. Yeah. So having little rituals, I've talked to people that do everything from they drive home listening to heavy metal to singing. Some people like to do phone calls um, when they're driving or that's part of their transition. Some people like absolute silence. When I get home, I like no noise, nothing, zero. Sometimes my wife is home and I'm like, could you turn that off? So like, <laughs> 30 minutes and I'll be reset, you know? I'm right. like, absolutely quiet, so weird. Never would have thought that would be what happens for me. Um, some people smudge, mm -hmm. um, some people follow other um, native and traditional traditions for themselves and their culture. Mm -hmm. um, so then, right, we talked about containment um simplifying to-do lists right like all this you, you kind of mentioned the sports psychology earlier today and there's right these organizational psychologists that talk about doing a brain dump before bed that people sleep better uh that are big ceos of big companies if they do a brain dump before they go to sleep so mm -hmm. brain dump do your nighttime rituals and go to bed but if you dump out all the things that you're thinking not necessarily make a list of things to do but just get that dump down that that really helps yeah, um, that helps me so much. I don't necessarily do it every day because every day things are hard to me in general, but um, I think we've talked about this multiple times, but um, yeah, just like getting it out, right? Getting it out on paper. Again, not necessarily a to-do list, but yeah, I have multiple notebooks that I just will just dump. You don't even have to come back to it. It's just like, get it out. Yeah, clear some space. Yes, exactly. The other thing that I was hearing that might be really useful, I just want to jump in really quick about the transition from work to not work. If you are, you know, you're doing counseling, telehealth counseling, but you're still, you know, working with people. If you're working from home, you can still create those rituals for yourself, right? If people are now working from home that weren't before, maybe they're, maybe it was automatic because in their drive home, they just automatically listened to a podcast or a music or whatever, <laughs> called their mom. But now we may be not changing our clothes every day or, you know, whatever the thing is <laughs> for a week, right? And one of the things that was so surprising for some of the people in my self-care challenge is I said, get up, take a shower and brush your teeth first thing in the morning. And that made a huge difference for some of their days. And they weren't expecting that because they're not going anywhere. Right. right. But just having those things where you're transitioning from, you know, whatever work mode to mom mode or whatever the thing is, that intentional ritual about it can be really helpful. So I think that's a good reminder for me and for everyone who is working from home right now. Yeah, it's so good. I'm so glad to refocus that because, um, yeah, especially during this time, it, I love that you, you acknowledge that because it kind of reminds me of the only thing I know similar to this is in the winter. If I don't have a garden to work in, mm. suddenly I'll feel like really tough and I can't figure out what's missing. And it's because I haven't been able to go out and like mess around in the dirt and dig up stuff and move things and whatever, plant things. So like now we're in this weird position where we can't do those things. You just named like the natural transition we already had built into our days, yeah. the driving in the car yelling or whatever we're doing <laughs> to get home. The bicycle ride home, right? That's the debrief that, you know, the decompress. Yeah. For yeah. some people, right? Some people are still going to work and they're needing to do these things still. Yeah. Some people are not. And so, um, 
if your natural rhythms are knocked off, like my sleep rhythm, all those things. I saw your, I saw your post about um, showering, and I was like, yeah, that's that's the real deal. Put on, you know, brush your hair, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I know. I think I wore the same therapy sweater like four days in a row, and I was like, okay, this yellow sweater's got to go. That's retired for the year. It's tired of hearing things, you know. Um, <laughs> Oh, no, I'm totally distracted by that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, how are we supposed to do that in our homes? So I guess I'm a little bit like, yeah, how do you make those transitions happen? And so I think that must be like, um, I mean, I'm changing looking, my like, clothes. Oh, yeah, in. changing my clothes is a huge piece of it. Like, I put on clothes for work every single day, even though today is a Sunday when we're recording this. Like, I have, for some reason right now, I have video calls every morning of my life. So I get up, I take a shower, I put on work clothes, I put on yeah. earrings, literally wearing earrings. And then I think this is subconsciously how I'm, cause I've been working from home for years, right? But when I take my earrings off, even if oh. I don't change my clothes, I'm off, I'm off work. That's great. Isn't that funny? I love that. That's yeah, or I put on my nighttime pajamas if I've been in my, I mean, honestly, this outfit is kind of like daytime pajamas, but. <laughs> no, that's a really good one. I, I like that. And I feel like you're triggering some real thoughts for me about like, when is it that I'm taking my jewelry off? Or when is it that I put on my pajamas? Um, my wife and I try to race it. We have a game where we race into our pajamas to see who can get into them first sometimes at the end of the day. But we haven't been doing that as much because sometimes we're still wearing our pajama bottoms at the end of the day. So your whole philosophy is great, right? Um, yeah, so the transitions for me have looked like, oh, making a cup of tea, um, maybe cleaning the counters off has been a good transition in the kitchen. A lot of people are, are, are writing about like how many dishes they have in their house as they're cooking at home. <laughs> cooking. Um, yeah, I like your idea about changing clothes. It might be like go outside and take a walk around the block if that's all you can do mm -hmm. to transition. Yeah, that that's outside. That's a, probably a really good idea right now. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's kind of a stumper. That's a tough one. Um, you know, um, so some things that help with hyper arousal, right? Which is part of what happens to us when we get we're too stimulated. Um, so that's going to happen to the average person. You were kind of going back to this, the average bear, you know, that's watching the news or just trying to deal with their kids or trying to deal with their partners that are sick or whatever transitions happening, um, is I think we move into kind of emotional, um, first aid. And what that looks like is just being like, uh, blankets, soft things, having water, um, hot water bottles can be really helpful right now. Um, titrated movements so like moving the toes a little bit rolling the shoulders opening and closing your palms people even talk about there's this one organization that's talking right now about talking to your own nervous system like writing your nervous system a letter um, talking to yourself like okay nervous system thank you so much i feel like you're a little on hyperdrive right now so let's see if we can just really calm this down and for some people that's corny for some of us that works really well because we're working in those on those relationships with ourselves right um i think uh it, during these times it's cultivating an awareness of um, resilience resilience and people that have been through way worse than i've been through that's for sure mm -hmm. and um how they survived um finding people that we respect and and taillights to follow like who do I listen to? Where do I go to get inspiration and new thoughts? I'm always surprised at where people get those from, you know, a variety of places. Like some people it's reading. Um, some pe I, always, I often go to Annie Lamont, which is really interesting. I'll look up what she's been thinking about or writing about or like Toni Morrison or, um, uh, you know, there's a variety of people anyway that I'll, I'll go to kind of follow what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, this other, this organization that I've been reading about, they've been talking about uh, focusing on the glimmers of the day, which I kind of love because you and I both love the sparkles. So it's like, what are you noticing that's glimmering throughout the day? So that's noticing um, things that bring you joy in the day. Um, sensation, it can be, it, but the glimmer, a glimmer is like a little shine, right? It's not like, 
I found gold. It's like um, the glimmer on the water. So yeah. that might be, um, oh, I'm obsessed with wearing my red tennis shoes right now. It's just it's ridiculous. Um, uh, the glimmer. So my wife the other day said something to me. Oh, she called me her best wife. And I've used that in my bio. I was like, yeah, I'm your best wife. Little things that people are saying or doing or things in our homes that remind us of people that love us, that um, this organization is talking about like um, taking a moment and looking at the thing that someone gave you that meant something to you and trying to kind of go in there and relive that positive experience can be a nice mm -hmm. kind of bringer, bringer upper. Um, and does that stimulate, because I know Gretchen Rubin has done a lot of studies or has, has referenced a lot of studies about happiness and and that remembering a happy moment can give us those same kind of like endorphins. And is that kind of similar to the motor neurons, do you think, where you're, you're kind of like stimulating that pathway instead of the trauma, fear, anxiety yeah. pathway? Yeah, just like we were talking about going home and watching Special Victims Unit. Well, what if you um, spend time reflecting on, like I've been doing a lot of meditations recently on... Um, this is how I meditate. I think about all the people recently who, over my lifetime, who have invested in me as a human being. Mm -hmm. I've just been spending time thinking about, like, as an adolescent going through a retraining program, mm -hmm. thinking about family members that prayed for me to get better from my addiction, thinking about adv supervisors and advisors through my career, thinking about you, Michelle Casey, thinking about the people that have been in my life who've invested time and love and energy into me. And there's something really potent about that, you know? Yeah. And to think of ourselves as investments too feels very, um, that doesn't feel like a false, like build confidence, feel good about yourself. It's like positive thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Like how you really create that. Um, I love that. The other things are like the self taking care of the self, like um, working on a plan B. If, you know, Laura Van Newt Lipsky talks a lot about a plan B and I love that about her. If I have a plan B, then I don't feel like I'm stuck here. And no matter what we're doing, even if we're in just totally like, it, whatever kind of work we have, we could always be doing something else. Even if it's working at McDonald's, you could go work at Burger King. I don't know. That's so interesting <laughs> because having a plan well, so I had like a plan a, B, C, and D, when we were waiting to see if the lava was going to eat our house two years ago. Right, right. Which was, which was traumatic. That was like a long, slow trauma. It reminds me a lot of this. I feel very blessed that I went through that before this because I feel like it gave me a lot of resources. But there was literally like, we had, if the lava gets to our house, but doesn't take the house, but cuts, cuts it off. If the lava takes our house and the insurance doesn't pay out. If the lava gets our house and the insurance pays out, and if it was like that, you know, on some level, I felt like, am I just trying to control things I can't control here? But it, it's actually really gratifying to hear that that's a valid trauma strategy because it gave me peace of mind and it gave me something to do while I was literally just waiting. I was just waiting for to figure out what was going to happen next, which is so much of the feeling of what's happening now. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You were, you were in ambiguous grief, which is what we're all in right now, which is yes. this experience of being unmoored and not knowing when we can come to shore. We don't know when this is going to end. We don't know. And we're afraid for people are afraid for their lives. Right. Yeah. So, or for other people's lives for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right. So, um, finding ways to, um, yeah, that's that. That's such a powerful story. I'm kind of like in that for a minute here about what it was like to be so unsure about if you were losing your house. And I know that you lost all of your belongings in that, and that had to. Be, yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, so, but, yeah. And then there was all the contingencies about what we were gonna if we were gonna go back and get the furniture and how you know we had to make so many decisions. I really felt like I had decision fatigue for about a year afterwards. I was just like, I just can't. We had, you know, we found a new house, which is wonderful. And I love house shopping. So that part wasn't hard, but you know, it was like, I just don't want to make any major decisions for a really long time now. Like I'm done. I think that's what people are in now. Um, that same experience that you're talking about where there's the decision fatigue about like, do I go to the store? Do I, 
you know, yeah, people are exhausted. Yeah. So, um, I don't think we, we, there are a lot more concrete skills that we could talk about. I think we're probably coming to an end in our time together. Cool. But, um, you know, I'll, I've, I shared my website with you. I shared some other resources with you. Um, I have a really great, on the website that I shared with you, there's a page called, um, it's the, it's the tonight or tomorrow activity. And so it's uh, an activity of trying at least two things off of a list of activities for regulating your nervous system. And so those might be fun to put up for people to try. Nice. Uh, there's a real variety on there. So um, nice. I'll, yeah, I'll put everything in the um, the show notes of the video. Cool. So yeah, people okay. will have those resources available. And um, and you also do kind of like custom consultations for people, right? For individuals, for organizations, not just for therapists, but right. you can work with lots of different types of people about compassion fatigue and compassion satisfaction. So I want to make sure we say that as well. And um, and I'll put your contact information, you know, just let me know how you want people to, to reach out to you if they want to talk to you about, you know, doing something for their organization or, um, yeah, so email is great. That's perfect. And perfect. yeah, like I said, I, I do love working with organizations that are, um, that aren't necessarily related to mental health because obviously there's so much fatigue that happens. That's just outside of that. Yeah. So, Yeah. Oh my God, Catherine, thank you so much for doing this today. This was so lovely and I know it's going to help so many people. I cannot wait to post it and um, I just appreciate you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you.